Hello and welcome back for chapter 10 of the Roman Mysteries. So we're on scroll 10 or chapter 10. That's amazing, breathed Jonathan, admiring Lupus' sketch of the man. Who taught you to draw? Lupus pushed out his lower lip and shrugged as if to say it was not difficult. Do you know this man? asked Flavia. Lupus shook his head. Then how could you draw him? Lupus jerked his thumb back towards the graveyard. Then he mimicked someone weeping. You've seen him crying at his daughter's grave too. Lupus nodded. When? asked Jonathan. Lupus thought for a moment, flicked up three fingers, then four. Four different times, he nodded. My old nurse Alma told us that his name was Publius Avitus Proculus, Flavia said to Lupus. He's a sailor and he lives further up this street. Why kill dog? asked Nubia suddenly. He hates all dogs because his daughter was killed by one, explained Jonathan. Hates dogs. Dogs. Thinks dogs bad. No, wait, said Flavia. Nubia's right. Why did he kill Bobus? Bobus was a tame dog, not a wild one, and he was shut up here in the house. Perhaps Bobus looked like the dog who bit his daughter, suggested Jonathan. Or maybe he was passing by and heard Bobus bark and became mad with grief and killed him. Maybe, said Flavia. Still, we've got to be sure it was him before we accuse him of such a crime. They were all silent for a few minutes. I know, cried Flavia suddenly. Let's show your drawing to Libertus across the street and see if he thinks it's the same man he saw running away. Good idea, agreed Jonathan, and then his face fell. But my father told me to stay inside until he got back. Lupus too, and I have to do my chores. Then Nubia and I will go, announced Flavia. And seeing Jonathan's disappointed face, she added, Don't worry, we'll come straight back. Flavia hesitated for a moment before Cordia's house and then rapped on the door. The knocker was a fat bronze dolphin whose nose banged loudly on a bronze scallop shell. Knocker, said Flavia to Nubia automatically as they waited for a reply. Then dolphin, shell, green, green door, dog barking, peephole, opening. Hello, she said politely to the beady eyes that appeared in the tiny window. I know your master is away, but may we speak to Libertus, please? The eyes regarded her suspiciously. My father is your master's client, added Flavia. After a moment, the sliding door of the peephole shut and they heard the grate of the bolt sliding back. An extremely thin slave with a sour face opened the door. Straining against a leash wrapped around his hand was a large red hound who snarled and bared his teeth at them. Flavia shrank back in alarm, but Nubia slowly extended the back of her hand to the dog and spoke softly in her own language. Immediately, the dog stopped snarling and sniffed her hands, then he licked it. The doorkeeper cursed the dog under his breath and beckoned the girls in. Flavia hesitated on the threshold. On the floor was a mosaic. Tiny pieces of coloured clay and stone showed a fierce black dog against a red background. The mosaic dog was straining his against his lead and baring sharp teeth, and below him were the words, Cave Canon, beware of the dog. I certainly will, muttered Flavia under her breath. Wait here, grumbled the sour-faced porter, and went off with his dog to find Libertus. While they waited in the atrium, Flavia and Nubia looked around in wonder. Flavia had never been in Cordia's house before. It was the home of a very wealthy man, at least three times as big as hers. The atrium had a beautiful floor of black and white marble and in its middle, under the open skylight, a fountain bubbled in a gold-tiled impluvium. On the walls around them were frescoes depicting scenes from the travels of Aeneas, the legendary hero who founded Rome. Look, pointed Nubia, dog with three heads. Flavia gazed in delight at the pictures on the wall. Yes, it was Cerberus. Cerberus, he was very fierce. He's the hound who guards the gates of the underworld, land of dead people. Cerberus, said Nubia in wonder and walked over to the wall. Flavia followed her and they both examined the three-headed hound opening all his mouths at a startled Aeneas. Behind Aeneas, a woman held out her hand to the dog. I don't remember that part of the Aeneid, murmured Flavia to herself. Book six, said a man's voice behind them and they both started guiltily. It was Libertus, and he did not seem angry. His dark blue eyes sparkled as he quoted, Huge Cerberus makes a case of the underworld echo with his three-throated barking. Libertus pointed. 
That's the scene where Aeneas Guide gives the hellhound a drugged biscuit so that he can pass by. Libertus nodded at the frescoes with approval. They're beautiful, aren't they? he said. Very beautiful, agreed Flavia. Come through to the garden, he said with a smile. As you know, Cordius is away, and in his absence, I'm the master of his house. He led them out of the atrium and down some steps into a beautiful garden as big as Flavia's entire house. As its centre was a large ornamental pool, with two bronze dolphins spouting water at each other. Six laurel trees trimmed into perfect balls had, even, had been planted on either side of the pool, and at one end stood an elegant palm tree, its top half lit gold green by the early morning sun. Flavia could see mosaic patterns on the garden paths, and bronze statues half hidden in the fragrant shrubbery. She heard the snip of a gardener's shears, and then noticed another slave sweeping the peristyle, the columned walkway that surrounded the garden. There was not a leaf out of place, and even the dew on the mimosa seemed to sparkle like diamonds. Please sit, Libertus gestured at a cedarwood couch with orange linen cushions. Taking a seat on a similar couch opposite the girls, he leaned forward, elbows on knees, and smiled. How may I help you, Flavia Gemina? Remember we told you yesterday that Jonathan's dog was killed? Yes, he replied gravely, and a frown creased his smooth forehead. A terrible matter. And you saw a man running? Yes, carrying a leather bag. Well, is this the man you saw? Flavia pulled the wax tablet from her belt and showed it to him. Libertus took the bit tablet from her and examined it carefully. Yes, he said slowly, clean shaven, hair combed forward, and those heavy eyebrows. Yes, he nodded. I remember the eyebrows, how they met over his eyes. And I think he was wearing a pale tunic. Pale yellow? It was pale yellow, now that you come to mention it. Yes, I'm certain this is the man I saw running down the street yesterday. The girls had just told Jonathan and Lupus their exciting news about the running man when they heard a knock on the door at Mordecai's, and Mordecai's voice calling his son. We really must get a new watchdog, sighed Mordecai as they let him in. I do miss Bob, as he added sadly. Jonathan had cleared away the breakfast things and now he bought his father a cup of mint tea. They all sat on the carpet in a sunlit corner of the garden. Mordecai was wearing a Roman-style tunic and mantle, presumably to impress the city officials, and for the first time Flavia saw him without his turban. His hair was black, streaked with grey, and quite long. He had tied it all back, including the distinctive locks that usually fell in front of his ears. The magistrates have received other complaints about the wild dogs, and they assured me that they have men out looking for them even now. They promised they would bury the dogs. I killed last night. As for the crime of Bobber's killing, it's not so simple. They're reluctant to get involved. Mordecai sipped his mint tea reflectively. I have an appointment to see an official later this morning, and then I must visit some patients, so I'll be, I may be out all day. Flavia, may Jonathan and Lupa stay at your house? I don't want to leave them here alone. Of course, said Flavia, they'll be perfectly safe at our house. I've locked our door, said Mordecai to the four of them a short time later. They were standing on the hot pavement outside Flavia's house. Here's the key, Jonathan. Keep it at Flavia's and only use it if you need to get in urgently. With any luck, I'll be back shortly after midday. But who knows? With city officials, anything is possible. Now promise me you won't get into trouble and that you won't go far. I promise that I won't even leave this street, father, said Jonathan earnestly. Very well, said Mordecai. Peace be with you, my children. And peace be with you, they answered, and watched him hurry up the road. As soon as he turned the corner by the green fountain, Flavia turned to Jonathan. We promise not to leave our street, she said, but Avatus House is on the street, and I've just thought of a brilliant plan for getting in. Thank you. Join me for another chapter. Bye for now.